In the Southeast Asian jungle, a rare glimpse of one of the most exotic and endangered species in the world. It's the Sumatran rhino, hunted by poachers to the brink of extinction. This rhino, named Torgon, rescued by scientists from certain death, will be shipped halfway around the world and back, all in a last-ditch effort to avoid becoming the last rhino. In the early 1980s, on the island of Sumatra, this rhino, who was about four years old, lived in quiet obscurity until 1985, when fate opened up the outside world to him. A male rhino just reaching maturity, he was named after the rainforest of Torgamba, which his ancestors had wandered for countless generations before him. Back in 1985, no one could foresee that Torgamba would play such a critical role in the effort to save his species. After all, few humans had ever observed a Sumatran rhino outside a zoo. This is the most extensive footage ever shown of the secret of rhinos in their native habitat, thanks to special sanctuaries recently carved into the jungle in Indonesia and Malaysia for Torgamba and a select few of his companions. From the start, Torgamba's indomitable spirit inspired Tom Foos, the leader of the global effort to protect and save the Sumatran rhino. Torgamba does uh, represent a synopsis of, of the entire saga of, of the Sumatran rhino. He still is uh, uh, one of our best hopes for being able to uh, to propagate and 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 preserve this species. So yes, I have a I have a very special attachment for for tor Torgamba. While Sumatran tigers, monkeys, elephants, and other exotic creatures attracted most of the attention of conservationists. A small group of scientists knew the jungle harbored another extraordinary animal. One they knew little about. Even among the rhinos, the Sumatran rhino being more primitive, being a tropical forest species, there's a lot of knowledge that, that we, need to, we need to acquire and we don't have very much time. Once, over a hundred different rhino species roamed the world. Today, there are five. Two in Africa and three in Asia. A century ago, tens of thousands of Sumatran rhinos inhabited Southeast Asia. From India to the island of Borneo. Now, only an estimated 300 survive in the wild. On peninsula Malaysia, Borneo, and Sumatra. The Sumatran rhino is called the hairy rhino because of its thick mat of reddish brown hair. A relative of the woolly rhino, its ancestry reaches back to the last ice age, 15,000 years ago which makes it one of the most primitive animals alive today. Stone Age hunters likely killed off the woolly rhino, and today's scientists were convinced history would repeat itself without intervention. An all too familiar reason for the decline in Sumatran rhinos is the destruction of the rainforest. Throughout Southeast Asia, millions of acres have been cleared to make way for a different species. An explosive growth in population triggered a mass exodus from the cities, turning the pristine forest into overcrowded suburbs. In other areas, settlers and logging companies cleared the forest to make way for farms and palm oil plantations. Major cash crops for the burgeoning population.
For 22 years, Mohamed Khan was Malaysia's director of wildlife and national parks. Today, as he surveys the Malaysian countryside, he nostalgically recalls the lush tropical forest that greeted him on his first visit in 1958. This whole area was nothing but forest. Uh, swamp forest, uh, plenty of water, and it's very difficult to walk. We need uh, the land for what you call uh, agriculture, and uh, the forest here um, has been, what you call, uh, cleared uh, to make way for agriculture. Despite the loss of habitat, there's still enough wilderness to support thousands of Sumatran rhinos. Some 40% of Malaysia remains forested. Nevertheless, throughout the rainforest, a growing network of logging roads has paved the way for an even more sinister threat. According to Khan, now chairman of the group working to preserve all three species of Asian rhinos. It is one of the most endangered species of wildlife in the whole world. And uh, the, the reason for um, the endangered status, I think, is uh, the people kill these rhinos. Poachers are after the rhinos because of the high commercial value of the rhinoceros. To be more specific, the threat is as plain as the two horns on Tergamba's face. The rhino uses his horn for pulling down branches to feed on leaves and for defense. These rhino horns fetch a premium on the black market. They're used in traditional Chinese medicines and for ceremonial dagger handles in the Middle East. At a rate of $25,000 a pound, in effect, there's a $50,000 bounty out on Tergama on the black market. This is a, uh, a rhino rib bone, Sumatran rhino rib bone. This is a, uh, a backbone, and this is a, a hoof. These all these are all found in the in the forest at uh, at the site of rhino kills. Sumatran rhino parts are considered more potent and thus more valuable than African rhino horn, according to Philip Wells, who works for the International Rhino Foundation in helping Indonesia in organizing teams to stop the poachers. The teams, called rhino protection units, conduct military-style sweeps of the jungle. These researchers see evidence of the poacher's technique. This is the this is the uh, the, the the killing zone of the trap. It's the steel cable around the. The snare is rigged to a tree and set to detonate when tripped by an unsuspecting rhino or any other creature that wanders into it. This is a rhino size log. Once a rhino is trapped, any struggle to escape only tightens the noose. The animal can suffer for days before dying of its wounds or lack of water. It will probably look as if a, as if a bomb has exploded as the animal struggles for, for as long as it has any energy left inside it to try and escape. And it will, there'll, be, there'll be a crater here. This deadly inhumane device, more than any other cause, has brought the rhino to its knees. Hopefully, the anti-poaching teams can find and defuse more snares before the animals stumble upon them. In 1985, there were no such patrols, and rhinos were disappearing at the rate of 50 to 100 a year. If there was to be hope for the rhinos, if Torgamba was to be saved, something had to be done, and fast. For years, he had eluded both poachers and the prying eyes of scientists. Little did he know that now the fate of his kind would rest upon him. In the mid-1980s, scientists thought that some 800 to 1,000 Sumatran rhinos might still exist in the wild. 
those that still roam free, it was estimated that at least a fourth were condemned to die due to the loss of their habitat and poaching. Among them was Torgamba, then a young rhino roaming a secluded yet isolated tropical forest soon to be cut down. In those days, there were no sanctuaries for Torgamba or any other Sumatran rhino. Nico Van Streen, a leading Sumatran rhino field biologist, and his colleagues knew something had to be done. If the Sumatrans couldn't be protected, then why not rescue the most vulnerable, breed them in captivity, and someday release them in the wild? The Dutch scientists, however, knew it would be a challenge. Though Sumatran rhinos were among the first rhinos exhibited in zoos, only one had ever been bred in captivity, and that was a century before. This female, named Bagoom, pictured in 1899, resided at the London Zoo. Well, there have been quite a number of Sumatran rhinos in captivity, but the majority didn't survive very long. And there was never any breeding, except in the very early, um, the very early state, stage of the movement of Sumatran rhinos in, uh, into zoos, when uh, there was a calf born in, um, in Calcutta Zoo at the end of the last century. Still, the odds of success seem good, or at least better than the chances of the doomed rhinos surviving on their own. This rare historical film shows the teams of trackers that took to the Indonesian rainforest in May of 1985 to rescue Torgamba and the other doomed rhinos. Similar squads scoured the jungles of Peninsula Malaysia and Borneo. All were searching for the same thing. Rhino signs, like the horn scrapings found on this tree, kept them going, according to the International Rhino Foundation's Tom Foose. There was a lot of optimism, uh, hope and expectation in the early days that uh, a captive propagation program for the Sumatran rhino could be uh, successfully developed. Uh, we were reproducing three other species of rhinos in captivity and so there was every reason to expect that we would be able to achieve the same kind of success with the Sumatran rhino. Taking a lead from poachers, the next phase of the operation was to set a trap. The trick was to do it as safely as humanly possible. Traps were checked every day for three months, but the rhinos remained as elusive as ever. Then finally, one steamy morning in November, a young Sumatran rhino wandered down this path in the region of Torgamba, browsing for food. It was a male, approximately four years old, confused perhaps, but uninjured. Finally, scientists had their big break. This was their first glimpse of Torgamba, and the first time most of them had seen a Sumatran rhino. Since large mammals like rhinos don't tolerate heat well, a canopy of leaves was rigged to keep him cool from the 100 degree sun until he could be moved. Right from the start, they knew he was special. Torgamba proved how little the experts knew about the Sumatran rhinos. He was smaller and even hairier than they had expected. But the biggest surprise was how well he adjusted to his fate and the intense scrutiny. He was one of the shyest and most solitary creatures on Earth, yet adapted to captivity and humans as if it was the most natural thing on Earth. It was very astonishing. Torgamba was uh, extremely 
uh, calm and settled as soon as he emerged from the, the pit into the corral. It really was phenomenal to observe how rapidly he adapted to a, uh, a captive situation. Once inside the camp's corral, Fergamba appeared to thrive in his temporary surroundings, basking in the attention. But other rhinos captured soon after were not so lucky. This one was in poor physical condition and suffered from a painful infection on its leg inflicted by a poacher's snare. Eventually, 40 Sumatran rhinos were captured, but the mission was not complete. Torgamba was the first Sumatran rhinoceros caught and the first to leave. So the plan was to send Torgamba more than 7,000 miles away, leaving behind the disappearing rainforests of Southeast Asia and the only home he's ever known. And the journey will not be his last. A few miles south of London in the English countryside is the Port Lim Wild Animal Park. Established by British millionaire John Aspinall, the park is dedicated to saving endangered species by breeding them in captivity and releasing them in the wild. The park has been a proven success, as this rare black rhino and her calf can testify. Black rhinos flourished in Africa until poachers took aim, reducing their numbers from 65,000 in the 1970s to 3,000 today. A successful breeding program helped slow the decline. 20 black rhinos had been born here at Port Lim alone. Scientists were convinced that if they could save the black rhino, they could save the Sumatran using the same techniques. Torgamba arrived here on April 4th, 1986. The stormy weather, a precursor of things to come. A world away from the steamy jungles of Indonesia, he took to his new home immediately, just as when first captured. Hello, big fella. In a spacious and specially designed enclosure, Torgamba displayed the playfulness and personality that would endear him to his keeper and soon-to-be constant companion, Martin Ellis. He was very easy to be his friend, obviously. He's uh, such a very sweet-natured animal, so um, you could play with him. He'd kind of chuck me about a bit. He'd throw me off his horn. Uh, he was really playful. He'd drag a log around the paddock and he'd chase it, and he'd throw this log around. And... So quite playful, quite young at heart. As adaptable as he was to humans, there was little doubt he would also adjust to a mate once the perfect female was found. On the other side of the Atlantic, the rhinos appeared to make the transition with equal ease. Come here. Come here. Cry, baby. Cry, baby. Cry, baby. Within Cry, baby. weeks of arriving in the United States, this female, named Baracus, was already surprisingly enthusiastic and energetic. With her outgoing personality, Baracus formed a remarkable rapport with her attendant, seemingly at home right from the start. They're really sweet. It's really nice. But finding Baracus a mate proved to be more difficult than anyone expected. Between 1985 and 1995, 40 Sumatran rhinos were sent to 10 designated breeding centers at zoos in the United States, England, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Shortly after being caught, they were shipped off with the intention that a mate would soon follow. However, it was even more difficult than expected to capture equal numbers of males and females to form breeding pairs quickly, a problem that slowed the captive breeding program from the start. 
and no one could foresee that luck would also take a fateful turn. In England, Torgamba was one of the lucky ones, but not for long. A female sent to keep him company in 1986 died before Torgamba got to spend even one moment with her. Without a partner for Torgamba, there was no chance of breeding. Obviously something had to be done and it was going on and on and on. And I kept saying to Torgamba, you know, you're going to get a mate soon, you're going to get your sorted. And... Confidence gave way to concern as word spread of problems cropping up in other breeding centers as well, such as this one in Borneo. While some ailments were more serious than others, the complications invariably undermined the breeding effort. Tan Jun, a 10-year-old male in Sepalak, suffered from a painful foot infection linked to his mud hole. To ease Tan Jung's discomfort and prevent the problem from spreading, the staff outfitted him with a makeshift pair of boots to help him get around. Until treated and cured, the chances of Tan Jung breeding were remote. Some animals also began losing their eyesight, a direct result of being removed from the densely shaded jungle. Dusan, a female kept in an Indonesian zoo, developed cataracts from overexposure to the sun. While ointment helped reduce irritation and redness, scientists eventually concluded the best remedy was to shelter the creatures from too much sunlight. Most troublesome of all, rhinos in the breeding centers worldwide mysteriously began getting sick, this Malaysian zoo being no exception. In 1987, Jerome, a female, lost a potential partner when he abruptly died of unknown causes just three months after arriving here. That was only the beginning. Jerome, now one of the oldest surviving Sumatran rhinos in captivity, stood by as two more companions died as well, apparently from intestinal infections. In the United States, the kids, as Barakas and her male cohort came to be called, provided hope that they could produce the program's first calf. Yet in 1995, even they fell victim to an apparent intestinal disorder. Barakas and Tan Jun died within just four days of each other. Two of the world's rarest creatures, gone virtually overnight. In the United Kingdom, Torgamba was one of the few rhinos that was still as healthy and robust as ever. Yet he too was getting older, and he too was all alone, having outlived another female. A decade after Torgamba's arrival, his species' future was fading. The captured rhinos appeared as doomed in captivity as in the wild. Tom Foose and his team struggled to make sense of this anguishing turn of events. A number of us were realizing that the, the, the conditions that we were providing in captivity just really wasn't conducive to the, the, the propagation program. How had an animal that seemed initially to adapt so well to captivity begun to unravel just as quickly? Scientists suspected they would find the answer if they went back to the basics and took another look at the rhino's native habitat and its effect on the animals in the wild. The humid tropical habitat, so difficult to duplicate in a zoo, suddenly seemed more vital than previously realized. Though small compared to other rhinos, at just four feet in height and under a ton in weight, it's one of the largest herbivores in the tropical rainforest. Owner in the wild, the creature keeps completely to itself, marking its territory to warn potential intruders of its presence and to attract a companion during mating season.
Despite its relatively poor eyesight and marginal hearing, the Sumatran rhino is remarkably stealthy, relying on a sharp sense of smell to detect danger and capable of vanishing into the jungle at a speed of up to 30 miles per hour. Far more outspoken than its cousins, the Sumatran rhino has a wide variety of calls. Most active in early morning, evening and night, this recluse spends much of the day in a cool mud hole called a wallow. Besides cooling off from the stifling equatorial heat, the muddy potion protects its sensitive skin against flies and other insects. When unable to bathe regularly in the soupy solution, the creature's skin cracks and gets inflamed. This can lead to fatal infections. But it's the rhino's diet that really stands in contrast to captivity. In the wild, it feeds on more than 100 species of plants, an astonishing salad of native leaves, twigs, and fruits found nowhere else in quite the same combination. And they consume 100 pounds of it each day. There was no adequate substitute for this fresh foliage in captivity, according to field biologist Nico Van Street. While in the wild, these animals only eat fresh leaves, fresh, very soft material, contains a lot of moisture, and if you then try to uh, convert the, the animal into eating dry food, alfalfa, hay, pellets, I think that, that just upsets the, uh, the digestive system. Scientists suspected there was a connection between the Sumatran rhino's diet and the number of fatalities in captivity. Come on, two. But the near-death experience of this rhino, Ipu, convinced the team at the Cincinnati Zoo once and for all. Ipu dropped 260 pounds in six months. Lifeless, he was within hours of dying when his keepers went for broke. The Cincinnati Zoo rushed fresh ficus plants in from California and Florida, once a mainstay of Ipu's diet in the Sumatran jungle. Within eight days, Ipu regained most of his lost weight, though it took more than a year to fully recover. The cost of flying the foliage in added up to $190,000, the price of giving Ipu a second chance at becoming the first Sumatran rhino in a century to breed in captivity. A victory to be sure, but it was clear that scientists were losing the war. By 1997, more than half of the 40 rhinos captured for the captive breeding program had died, 23 fatalities in all. Just 17 of the rare rhinos were still alive. Many of them, like this venerable female named Bina, stranded and without hope of being paired soon with another of her species. Bina lived at an Indonesian wildlife park near Jakarta, aging and gradually running out of time. On the other side of the world was Torgamba, a survivor and harsh reminder that his species was different from any other. Still, one of the best hopes for perpetuating his kind just given one more chance. None of the other rhino species had been 
as difficult, the other three that, that are in captivity. Perhaps the reason is that the species is so primitive uh, and we've had no, no experience with, with anything quite as prehistoric as the Sumatran rhino. And so it was that the world scientists began to formulate another plan, one as dramatic and daring as the first, one that would again send Torgamba packing from England in a last-ditch effort to keep him from becoming the last rhino. With the stakes higher than ever, the first rhino captured and sent into captivity was the first to make his way home to Sumatra again. Torgamba, who left Sumatra 12 years earlier, landed back in his native country in January of 1998 to even more hoopla than when he first left. The plan was to transport the rhinos to larger and more natural sanctuaries in the tropical forest to induce reproduction. When Torgamba arrived in his new home, Waikambas National Park, he was greeted by two old friends, scientist Tom Foos and Nico Van Streen. Well, certainly uh, I, I feel that, it, that it's a tremendous achievement that we have these rhinos now here under much more natural conditions because I personally think that that is one of the reasons why the uh, rep reproduction of this animal in, um, in, in the more, more sort of artificial environment uh, they were in for a couple of years didn't work. It really is so, so gratifying to observe him back in the, in the native habitat. He I don't was, think he is much bigger now than he was then. No, it's, it, but he was definitely a young animal. Yeah, his horn was, was, was quite short, and now it's, uh, it really is pretty spectacular. Torgamba barely had time to explore his new surroundings before he was joined by two more Sumatran rhinos. The two females, Lina and Dusan, came from different zoos in Indonesia. Wild sanctuaries were set aside in Sumatra, Peninsula Malaysia, and Borneo, dedicated to giving the surviving rhinos one more chance to preserve their species. Of the 17 surviving rhinos from the breeding program, 12 made the trek to one of the jungle sanctuaries, while five stayed behind. The latest refugee to return was a revered resident of this zoo in Malaysia. Panjang, a female approximately 16 years old, was packed up and placed on a pickup truck for her repatriation to the jungle and a new sense of freedom. For anyone familiar with the Sumatran rhino's history, the sight of this rare creature being transported in a crate evoked mixed feelings of unfulfilled dreams. As the road-weary rhino reached her destination late that night, her arrival was hailed as a whole new beginning. <laughs> Torgamba's new home in Sumatra was the most spacious of the three Southeast Asian sanctuaries, 250 acres in Waikambas National Park. A huge electrified enclosure, reminiscent of the fences from the movie Jurassic Park, were built to keep the rhinos in and wild elephants and poachers out. Unlike their Hollywood counterparts, these prehistoric creatures needed time to adapt to their new world.
A medical team assembled by the International Rhino Foundation set out to give all 17 surviving captive Sumatran rhinos in the world a comprehensive checkup. The animals on which so much now depends underwent a battery of tests, including vital ultrasounds to check their capacity to reproduce. The results showed 10 of the 12 females were likely capable of producing offspring. Red blood cells, white blood cells, out of degree. Accurately analyzing the potency of the five remaining male rhinos was more problematic, but what they saw under the microscope indicated Torgamba and the others appeared fit to be fathers. At the sanctuary in Malaysia, veterinarian Dr. Zainal had other concerns the shy creatures that had distinguished themselves in captivity by their attachment to humans remained as friendly back in their native surroundings. So friendly, Dr. Zainal worried that the seven rhinos released here might not be able to adapt. As Dr. Zainal followed the rhinos, he saw signs in the forest that eased his concerns. Fresh scrapes on the trees and ground indicated the rhinos' instincts were taking over. They were staking a claim to their new territory. It's uh, basically marking uh, a territory or a sign of uh, aggression. Over in Sumatra, Torgamba and his two roommates were also looking and acting more like wild rhinos. Togamba is a, is, is a very good rhino and he immediately adjusted back to, to life in the, in the jungle as if he had never been out. He immediately started to make wallows, to dig around and, to, and then he will just lay there nicely for a couple of hours, then go up, walk around in his yard, uh, feed a little bit. Their improved diet, taken directly from the jungle, also paid dividends as the animals gradually appeared to become healthier and happier as they settled in. Yet one of Turgamba's longtime advocates couldn't help but worry about his friend's progress. So a year after Turgamba's triumphant return to Sumatra, Peter Litchfield of Howlett's and Port Lim Animal Parks came to check up on the rhino's well-being. Obviously, I've been, I've been very, very concerned all throughout the year. Um, Their reunion the convinced Litchfield that Turgamba truly belonged back in his homeland and gave him new hope that Turgamba might yet achieve the breeding success and, so uh, elusive in England. He's uh, greatly missed at home and people are always asking about him. I can well imagine. Yeah. And um, obviously I feel quite responsible for him because he was sort of entrusted to me to bring here and basically ensure that he was going to be okay. Well, hopefully there'll be some little Torgambas. Certainly hope so. <laughs> in the very near future. <laughs> yeah, we'll be able to it's see that. sort of up to him now. However, nature began to take its course elsewhere first, with a pair of rhinos at the Malaysian sanctuary. Dr. Zainal had trouble keeping up with a quick courtship taking place between a pair of rhinos named Ara and Saputi. I'm really looking at it uh, very positively that mounting will, will occur in the next 12 hours. Minutes later, the couple did indeed mate, just a second pair of rhinos to do so at the Malaysian sanctuary, and the first recorded on camera. Though the rhinos being bred at the sanctuaries have failed to produce any pregnancies yet, Dr. Zinal and the other scientists believe they are on the right track. Ironically, the most promising results so far come from the only Sumatran rhino still being bred in a zoo, the Cincinnati Zoo, under the supervision of Dr. Terry Roth. So far the behavior is what we want to see, because he's taking it slow, and he's interested, so... <laughs> she, she does this sometimes. She'll start cantering. Emmy, an eight-year-old female, and Ipu, the male who almost died before a change in diet, hit it off right from the start. 
producing a pregnancy the second time they were put together. Only Abby. It was the first confirmed pregnancy of a captive-bred Sumatran rhino in 108 years. Dr. Terry Roth was as proud as if she were expecting herself. Yeah, I was doing the ultrasound exam on her, and, and I've had a lot of experience in ultrasound examination in horses. And this pregnancy looked exactly like what it looks like in a horse. So as soon as I saw it, I said, wow, she's pregnant. Sadly, however, not pregnant for long. Despite the best care available, Emmy, who's now been pregnant seven times, has only managed to sustain the fetuses for a few weeks, nowhere near the 16 months needed to deliver a calf. The last time was the most disappointing for Terry Roth and her team. That was heartbreaking because we could see the fetus and we could see it move its limbs and the heartbeat. So um, that, was, that was tough. That was tough and we don't know why she lost that one. Despite the setback, Emmy's pregnancies led to a crucial biological breakthrough, which could explain the failure to breed Sumatran rhinos in captivity and lead to future success. For years, scientists assumed Sumatran rhinos should be kept apart, except when the female ovulates, because the male's aggressive behavior can actually endanger his partner. But during Emmy's pregnancies, Dr. Roth discovered Emmy ovulates only after breeding them. rather than before. Okay, we measure those and watch them as they grow. And inside all those follicles, there are eggs. 7.0. If Dr. Roth is right, to produce offspring, male and female Sumatran rhinos need to be allowed to spend much more time together, though with a chaperone to ensure the female's safety. That discovery goes a long way toward explaining why scientists have failed to reproduce Sumatran rhinos in captivity so far, and why they now believe it's only a matter of time until they do. If not, it could come down to this. Breeding rhinos from genetic samples being preserved in cryogenic storage tanks. Hundreds of strands of frozen Sumatran rhino semen are stored in Cincinnati's frozen zoo. Someday, cloning may even be considered. Well, most of the Sumatran rhino semen we keep in, in this tank. And we've actually got, we've got a lot in here. And theoretically, that will stay good for hundreds and hundreds of years. Whether the first birth occurs in Cincinnati or Southeast Asia, scientists need to know more how they would behave and adapt before releasing any captive-born rhinos into the wild. That's why the historic footage taken with this remote camera positioned in the Sumatran jungle generated a lot of excitement. It took more than a year to record. The first footage ever taken of a wild Sumatran rhino. After a lifetime of trying, the International Rhino Foundation's Tom Foos finally got to see his first Sumatran rhino in the wild. Oh, the video that you have of the Sumatran rhino in the wild is, is just, just phenomenal. I mean, my personal reaction is, is just ecstasy, uh, observing that animal. Uh, any bit of information that we have about this species, of which we know so little, has value. This rhino's location will remain undisclosed so as not to tip off poachers and jeopardize the creature's safety. The Sumatran rhino population, estimated to be at nearly 1,000 when Corgamba was captured, now has dwindled to 300. Habitat loss remains a deadly threat to its future. So do poachers, like this Indonesian man who was interrogated by anti-poaching units. In the last decade, he says 100 Sumatran rhinos were illegally poached in southwestern Sumatra alone. Yet Philip Wells and his teams have detected and destroyed dozens of rhino snares. Snares that might have meant another rhino lost forever. And the governments of Indonesia and Malaysia are doing more to catch and prosecute rhino killers. This is incredible. Still, when patrols uncovered dozens of lethal snares set to kill rhinos and other endangered species, the magnitude of what's at stake overwhelms even the most seasoned profession. Ah. 
But what will become of Torgamba? Protected in this Sumatran sanctuary, he appears destined to live a long life, perhaps to the age of 40. Whether Torgamba plays a role in perpetuating his species remains to be seen, but scientists are encouraged. Besides engaging in the rhino equivalent of foreplay, Torgamba and Bina have mated several times. Today, there are a few more answers than when Torgamba came on the scene, but also the same overriding questions. Humans almost certainly caused the extinction of the woolly rhino. The efforts to conserve the Sumatran or hairy rhino are an attempt to prevent humans from committing that same crime against nature twice. Will Torgamba and the other Sumatran rhinos go the way of their ancestors, the woolly rhino? Or will scientists pull this primitive species back from the brink of extinction? Time is running out.